Welcome to Food in the Capital Web Bites series. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you world-renowned expert on urban agriculture, water issues, and emerging agribusiness technologies, Henry Gordon-Smith. Henry is the founder and CEO of Agritecture, a world leader in urban agriculture and sustainable strategies with a client base that spans the world. Welcome, Henry. Hi, Suzanne. Thanks for having me. It is an absolute pleasure. So tell me all about agritecture and what you do. It's incredibly exciting. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. Agritecture is a global urban agriculture consulting firm. And so the main services we provide are helping entrepreneurs and organizations understand how they can get involved in urban agriculture in a for-profit way most of the time. So these are entrepreneurs that are starting their first hydroponic greenhouse or maybe they want to develop a vertical farming container, or maybe they want to do a series of urban gardens connected to real estate, or they want to do some warehouse vertical farm, or some of our clients are doing radical things like floating greenhouses. Whatever their idea is, Agritecture's job is to use data, best practices, and our stringent methodology to help them understand the risks they're getting into, reduce those risks, and have a plan to go forward. So we're talking about farm design, market research, economic modeling, and really project planning are the main services we do. And so we're based in New York, but as you mentioned, we've worked in 26 countries to date, and we've been consulting since 2014. I myself have been blogging and researching the topic of urban agriculture since 2010. That's incredible. So um, tell me a little bit about what the really cool successes you've had. What are the ones that have really excited you? And from the reading that I've been done, there's quite a lot. So you've got a lot to choose from. Yeah, let me just pull up some that I could show, show with you. Um, I just need to get the, you see to allow me to share the screen. So yeah, I, let me just talk about a few of the projects we've worked on. Uh, we were at almost 130 consultations already, but here are some highlights. Square Roots is a really interesting one because I think it really relates to this emerging technology of vertical farming and also some of the urban challenges and opportunities. So this is 10 vertical farming shipping containers in a parking lot that was previously empty in Brooklyn, New York. And the way it began was, what if we give entrepreneurs the opportunity to get access to the technologies to grow food? Uh, are we able to help them learn the skills and grow the business in selling the product? And so there were 480 applications for these 10 spots. And it, weren't, it wasn't a paid position. They had to take out a loan. They had to build their own business. They only made money as they sold uh, products grown in these. And so I thought that was pretty exciting that so many applicants were interested in doing this. Uh, furthermore, the project was able to raise another five and a half million and expand. And it's actually expanded into more of a wholesale strategy where it's connected to distribution centers using these containers that they've optimized over the, the years of experience now that they have. So that was a really exciting one. Again, thinking about how cities and vacant spaces could actually become productive and be a way for these farmers to have pathways. One of the things I think was very interesting is that a lot of the entrepreneurs that entered the program don't necessarily work in hydroponics or urban agriculture now. They actually do work in organic farms near the city or in soil-based farms or even ones out of state. So I think it's important to remember that urban agriculture isn't just about how much food can we grow in the city. It's also about creating access and pathways for young people to re-enter the agricultural system. And whether it's Australia or the United States, we have rising ages of farmers, so this is actually a critical issue that can be solved through urban farming. Sky Vegetables is one of my favorite for a couple of reasons. One, this is where I learned commercial hydroponics. So I was an intern there and I learned how to manage the NFT systems and grow the crops. I even helped with distribution as well a little bit. And I was doing some of their social media when I wasn't working with the plants directly. And it's a 10,000, 1,000 square meter rooftop greenhouse. So not an enormous one, but uh, for a rooftop, it's pretty impressive, especially because it's a new build and it's a lead platinum affordable housing building. So when we talk about food being available to those that need it, Sky Vegetables is an example of that because as part of their lease and their relationship with the building, they have to give a certain amount of product to the residents and they actually have to hire local employees. So it's integrated to the building and has other benefits like managing rainwater and keeping insulation. And what Agritecture did was once they had some challenges long after my internship, they hired us and actually took over the greenhouse for a period of two years, got them to their highest yield and helped them reduce their um, labor costs. And so they were able to move towards profitability, which is something we were very proud of. Next Level Farms is in the Philippines, so a little bit further away. This is another container option, and this is an example of 
how some companies start developing their own technology and then they hire agritecture to kind of optimize it. So Next Level had a technology that was working okay, but their margins weren't great. And so they hired us to maintain and rather review and do due diligence some of their HVAC systems, their cooling systems and their heating systems and their lighting and to optimize that. So we redesigned their container and we're able to get them a much more profitable container and they actually you know, integrate those into the urban environment. Um, so that's a pretty exciting one as well. And then Sidewalk Labs is more of like the macro scale, the kind of city scale. This is a Google smart city project. Unfortunately, it was just announced that it's ended. I think COVID-19 kind of killed it. But essentially, this was a $50 million smart city project in downtown Toronto. And they had a really challenging question for agriculture. They said, you know, we want to integrate urban agriculture, but we want to make sure it really responds to the rest of urban agriculture happening in Toronto. And we don't want to use up any of the valuable residential or commercial real estate that we're going to use to make money. So we had to get really creative. And so we used scenario analysis methodology, and we ended up concluding on 11 viable urban farming models without using any of those available spaces. So, you know, on my Sydney episode of Locally Grown in our podcast, we talk about lazy spaces and how many of those exist in the city that could be optimized for some kind of production. So this is a, a, just a brief snapshot of some of the projects we've worked on. Uh, on our website, our portfolio, you can see more of that. It's amazing. Really, really exciting work. So I've got a few questions. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Hopefully. So first and foremost, tell me about in planning a strategy to, for citywide sustainable food, what needs to be taken into account? Um, yeah, what sort of things have you come across in other cities and, and stumbling blocks and what sort of advantages and what do people need to think about to do this? Yeah, the very first step is that a city needs to recognize that agriculture is a use. It's a, it's a zoning use. It's a, it's a business. It's something that does have some appropriate fit within the city. And, and so traditionally, we've basically pushed farming outside of cities. And so most cities have um, a legislation that doesn't allow for agriculture to thrive in the urban environment. And there's some reasons for that, right? If you have got animals, if you've got large scale farming, you've got a lot of waste produced, you've got a lot of transportation. So it is a complicated topic. But I think to say that there's no agriculture allowed is a mistake as well. Um, and so the first step is recognizing it and trying to understand that it is useful. The next step is understanding, you know, what kind is useful? What kind of makes sense in our, in, in our city? And I think that's really related to a variety of factors. You know, what are the labor costs in our city? What are the food insecurity aspects of our city? So for example, if we look at Atlanta, Atlanta has 25% of its population that lives in food deserts. And most of the communities, and food deserts, by the way, are, are communities where people need to walk more than a mile to get access to fresh food. And many of those people in those communities don't have access to a vehicle consistently to get fresh food. So they're in a desert where, the, where they can't eat really healthy. So 25% of a major US city is, is in food deserts, okay? So we also looked at Atlanta and we saw that there are vacant spaces in those communities that have economic distress. So we created a program which says those vacant spaces the city of Atlanta created a program, we assisted with it, those vacant spaces can be optimized and given to individuals that live in those communities to grow their own food so that they can have fresh food in their communities, so they can understand it. And sometimes it's just about learning about it so that you cook better and know what you purchase. If you've grown up without access to fresh food your entire life and your parents did as well, how are you supposed to know how to eat healthy? So it's really, it's really about bringing food back into the community, healthy food back into the community. And that's one example. If we go to Paris, Right? It's a very different context. Paris is about organic and Paris is about greening the city and their sustainability initiatives. So you know, their strategy was to say, well, let's look at the city overall and what vacant spaces are available and let's do an annual competition where entrepreneurs can compete for it. And they brought on you know, various brands like LVMH and some of the, the department stores there and they brought on government buildings and grocers to provide spaces. And they've been able to accelerate near 95, I think, new urban farms um, through three years of the competition. I think it's about 16 hectares of urban farming space since the competition started. So pretty significant. And Paris is a kind of historical city. So it really, it really is different where you are. In, in Singapore, it's going to be about yield. In Singapore, because they import so much, it's going to be about, okay, how much can we really go? Bro, what's the quantity? We don't have any space. So the interest around there and the policies around there are really about how do 
We incentivize developers to integrate this at scale. How do we incentivize international companies to come here? So again, step one is recognizing it a use. Step two is connecting the right kinds of farming to your local challenge. And then I think step three is, just to simplify it in the interest of time, is an iterative process around that, is, is having leadership that's responsible for that. A director of urban agriculture, a minister of food security, as we see in the UAE, um, really there needs to be leadership. And, and that's one of the things that I'm excited about in visiting Canberra is, is to talk about how we can kind of initiate some of that leadership. Really good point. And that sounds to me like it would be a basis for food policies as well in order to put together food policy, because I know a lot of cities don't actually have one. Um, ironically, right. although I imagine they'll be looking at it now after COVID, that sounds like it would be the start of the food policy as well. Absolutely. 80% of our food will be consumed in cities by 2050. And yet 99% of cities don't have food policy councils. They don't have any policies related to their food security. So let me get this straight. So cities are consuming all of the food, but they're not part of the planning of where that food comes from or how they maintain it. That seems like a crisis waiting to happen or already happening in, in various aspects right now. So it is about that. I think the best um, you know, food policy method is really what the Toronto Food Policy Council did, where it's a combination, and, and that's been repeated by various cities, but it's a combination of local residents and local leaders, um, again, representing diversity of interests. Food is a complicated topic that, that relates to race and economic well-being and culture. So it's important that that's diverse and then also having certain policy leaders part of that for that dialogue. So that's a really good example of that. In NYC, we've got the NYC Agriculture Collective, which is really a collective of urban farmers that lobby the city and give the city information so that they can make policies. So there, there's a couple different examples across, across the world and, and how it's done, but those are some good examples there. What do you say to people who consider urban agriculture businesses um, are uh, small businesses and not primary producers. Yeah, I think, I think it's an interesting uh, criticism. So one way to look at it is right now, urban agriculture right now and in the developed world specifically. And you're right, it's small, it's mostly small businesses, a lot of startups, a lot of businesses that are just focused on local. But there are a lot of businesses that are trying to scale and go to multiple locations, be quite global. There are ones that are trying to disrupt significant percentages of crop categories. If you look at vertical farms and greenhouses near cities, uh, you, know, you may not think they're urban, but it still counts as urban if it's on the edge of the city and it's supplying that city directly and that's the focus of it. So I invite you to look up the description and definition of urban agriculture because it's more than just small scale community gardens it is really about impacting that food system overall. So there's a really a wide variety, but I think again, we are having a renaissance of urban agriculture. Historically, urban agriculture was a meaningful part of our food supply. Even in Asia, 50% of households are still estimated to grow their own food at their households. And actually that impacts a significant percentage of their consumption and of the food that they, they, they eat. So you know, when you're talking about volume, growing food in the city has the potential to, to achieve volume. Globally, urban agriculture is estimated to achieve at least, potentially achieve at least 10% of the global supply of vegetables and, and even some fruits that could be grown in certain climates regionally. If we look at US cities, right near the city, right? So just around the edge of the city, which is a little bit more like peri-urban local, but still, let's say under, under 24 hours, under 12 hours to get to the consumer, 70% of, of, of these fruits and vegetables could be produced. So what we're trying to say is trying to localize that food system, and it does start in some ways with the urban dwellers, because that's where the innovation happens, that's where the universities are, that's where a lot of the investment is. So if we want to change the food system, we do need to change it where people live, where the consumers are, and where the technology and the investment is. So I think, I think it's very easy to be skeptical about that, especially when it's coming from producers that get subsidies. So, you know, urban farmers don't get subsidies. So it's very easy to say you're a small business when you don't get any support from the government and you're not considered an agricultural use in many cases, and so you don't get the various benefits that larger producers do. I think if urban farms got the same subsidies that other farmers got, they would be able to scale up a lot faster. Very good point. So what is your food vision, and what do you see as the major roadblocks to that vision? Use Canberra well, as an example. Well, <laughs> you use Canberra as a par parable? <laughs> Go is that what you said? 
Indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, look, my, 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 my observation started when I recognized that we need to adapt to climate change. There are some people that are focused on climate change mitigation, but as I started studying sustainability, I felt that the way that I could make the biggest impact is on adaptation. And so we think about our food systems, um, maybe less now after COVID-19, but traditionally for generations, we think about our food systems as these kind of things we can just order from, that we just pay for it and it comes. And I think that that system is extremely fragile in my observations and my analysis. So my mission is to help cities be the leaders in adapting to climate change by valuing agriculture as a use, creating the talent for that agriculture, creating the policies for that agriculture, so that when shocks in the system happen, they're more resilient, okay? So my, my vision is that when a COVID-19 event happens, a city does not run out of fresh food. That's my vision. A city has a population that can scale up. We need to actually have more gardens. We have the gardeners to teach you. We need to have more farmers. Okay, we have the skills to train more farmers. We need to produce more food. Okay, we have some technologies and some equipment that we can do that with as well. And I think that most cities right now don't have that ability to adapt rapidly. So there's many, many visions of the ideal food system, the ideal city. But if I was to have a wish for cities in general and for Canberra, it would be that they could really be resilient to shocks in the system and be, be really independent, um, almost like the cities in the Middle Ages, where you never built population areas without the food needed to feed them. That sounds to me like it would also be something that would be very transferable. One of the things we noticed in Australia, because we are such a large country with so much space between so many the places, is that when we had the yeah. fires, for example, we had rural towns that were cut off and had no food. And we actually had food shortages, even though they were technically producers, there's no real food strategy within rural regions to be able for them to be able to manage once those roads are cut off. So it sounds like your your process is something that could be adapted around the entire country. And actually in countries that are susceptible to fires as large as Australia, it would have benefits in the rural regions as well. I mean, that's a fascinating um, point and thank you for sharing that. You know, while we don't do that much work in rural areas, I think we're really talking about, you know, the built environment, just farming where people live. And I think that the lines between rural and urban with some of the examples you gave, you know, are, are starting to mesh in some parts of the world as well. You look at Belgium and it's really kind of just one mix of farms and houses. It's not really clear what's urban and what's rural there. So I think that there are, are lessons to be learned from the data and the work that we're doing. Um, basically, I think that it's important that everyone has, you know, I mean, even in the US, just to add to your point, in the US, most of the food deserts are in rural areas. If you look at Iowa, if you look at Ohio, these rural communities actually don't have the production of fresh greens. Um, they've also created vulnerability as they've gone to more monoculture strategies. So it's an enormous challenge because I understand why monoculture in some ways means a better bottom line, but it is important in, a, in, in the face of climate change, in the face of things like these fires and these pandemics, that we do have more of a diverse and resilient system. So I think, yeah, I think absolutely it applies to rural environments too. And it's important as well, because in rural environments, young people are also leaving to the city. So we need to make sure that they have their own agricultural pathways locally. And I think that if all they're looking at is, you know, cornfields and cows, they may not feel inspired to innovate. Um, they, you know, they need variety. And that's why people find cities so inspiring is because there is that variety of ideas. That's what stimulates uh, entrepreneurship. That's what helps you identify challenges you can solve. And I think that some of those models could be applied to more rural or even smaller urban areas. There's a project for you. <laughs> so, um, next question. Life, lifelong project. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just keep you in Australia if that's okay, Henry. I can think of quite, every time you say something, I can think of a new project for you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've been stuck here for 94 days. So, you know, Australia is <laughs> maybe next. <laughs> <laughs> you might be stuck here a lot longer. It's all right. We welcome you. <laughs> okay. You. Next question. Can you give us an overview of the economics of this process? So um, evidence in terms of why a government would want to take it on in terms of increased food volume, better food, jobs generation, things like that. All those questions. The so government from a gov <laughs> yeah. So, so from a government perspective, you know, the urban ag tech sector, right? The use of technology, 
you know, even in the planning of these farms or even technology and operating them um, has, has a, a great potential. I mean, right now, indoor farming alone is a $9 billion global industry. So there's a lot of opportunity there. It's growing rapidly. Investment is growing rapidly. So even just from the perspective of, well, this is happening around the world. What's our piece of it? What's our unique, you know, approach to it? a place like Australia needs to get involved in that more actively because Australia is known as an agricultural leader. It does export a lot of food product and it does export agricultural technologies. So you can't miss an entire sector of a global movement around food security and around urban ag tech um, and just say, you know, we have the space, we have our ways of doing it at scale. We don't need to do that. There's many, many reasons to get involved. That's one of them. As far as how it affects the city as a whole, Again, you know, when your residents understand where food comes from better, meaning the urban residents that have been removed from the rural agricultural environment, they actually appreciate where their food comes from more. They become better voters about sustainability. They become better decision makers when they're planning sustainability initiatives at home or at work. And in the end, it kind of initiates this consumer behavior that is better for the city in the long term to be resilient and more sustainable. So, you know, they, if you don't see a farm all day long for years and years and years, you can't appreciate what went into the product you're eating. And so I think that's one of the important things to value as well. Another one is, is solving some of these equity issues around food. Now, vertical farms, in my opinion, don't solve um, you know, ac free access or open access to food for everyone. But projects like community gardens that are planned effectively that are managed effectively can make a significant impact on that. They can also help inter integrate immigrant communities, which is an ongoing challenge globally. Immigrants come and they, they actually share their culture and how they grow food. They learn English while they're working on these gardens. There's a lot of evidence from Toronto and Vancouver and Montreal that immigrant populations can be meaningfully integrated through community gardens. Um, schools, I mean, some of the schools that we work with at Teams for Who Justice, which builds vertical farms in classrooms, Test scores have gone up, attendance has gone up, sophistication of questions have gone up. And these are third party analysis of the work that's being done. The kids actually bring the healthy food that they grow home and they actually become kind of the parents to the parents. They tell them, no, we're not gonna eat mac and cheese. You know, let's cook this, let's have some fresh vegetables, let's have some tomatoes, let's have a salad. And so that transfer can happen very quickly. Food excites us. Agriculture can really excite the urban population and inspire us. Um, all of that ends up happening in a local economy kind of way. So you've got local dollars going to local businesses. And I think that it's already obvious to a lot of um, you know, cities why it's important to keep the money that people make inside of the city itself. So true. Lucky last question that's been sent to us. Um, if you, and this is a good one. If you have one piece of advice for Canberrans about this, what would that advice be? Uh, to Canberra, typical residents there? <laughs> I guess so. Yeah, is it, is it the residents there? Well, I, I haven't been there yet. So I look forward to meeting all of you um, and, and hearing from you myself. But Look, I think as a consumer, the best thing you can do is take an extra moment when you're shopping to think about where your product comes from and vote with your dollars. So when you spend money, you're showing what you support. So that's the first step. That's going to be a signal to politicians, but also to corporations and to farmers on what should be done. And in the end, the power of that consumer is very significant, especially at volume. Um, if you're interested in this topic yourself, you know, I would really start to get hands-on experience find the existing organizations, especially the nonprofit ones, and give some time to volunteer. Learn about their challenges, learn about what they've already experienced. There's all, typically what I find is there's so much happening already on the ground that's unknown. Even in Oman here where I'm stranded, I found a vertical farm that no one had promoted or heard about. And I was able to find it, learn about it, and promote it here to share with people. And so I, there are things happening in Canberra on the community level, and I bet there's even some people experimenting with hydroponic technology, microgreens, et cetera. So you want to find those people, you want to learn what they've learned and support them ideally and create these kind of networks to empower each other. That's what's been really effective in places like Paris and, and New York, why they've become leaders is because the farmers talk to each other. They have Slack channels, they have WhatsApp channels, they share their experiences, they trade excess packaging, they trade staff as people leave one to the other. So I think that ecosystem can be built and connected. So I would really take a look around 
and, and I think that that's a good place to start. Fabulous. Thank you very much for your time, Henry. It was absolutely fascinating and I'm sure all the viewers will absolutely lap up everything that you've said here. Yeah, it's such a pleasure. I really look forward to coming to Canberra and sharing much more detail on this. So I hope to see you all at the Food in the Capital event in November. And thank you so much, Suzanne, for your time today. Really appreciate it. We can't wait to see you here. Thanks so much, Henry.